Hey, welcome back to another week of Freedom Church Online. A genuine opportunity for us to bring you encouragement and challenge from God's Word. His Word, that as Scripture says, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. A word that brings insight and wisdom and is indeed life-giving. Church Online is also a genuine opportunity to worship God together, regardless of how many people may actually be stood around us. So why don't you join with me now as we anticipate God's word for our lives and as we express through song our worship of him. Good morning, church. It's so good to be able to worship together. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Reaching beyond the stars, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect love realized here with you. Holy Spirit. 
glory, God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Your presence that changes us. Your spirit that lives in our hearts, Lord. We stand in awe of you. We stand in awe of you. In the glory of your goodness, the beauty of your presence. And we're singing back. Just as I am, empty-handed, but alive in Your hand. We're singing majesty, majesty. Forever I am changed by Your love. Majestic is your name. Thank you, Lord. Forever I am changed by your Last Sunday was a beautiful time together in the open air. The sun shone, we worshipped, heard the word, and we prayed together. Thanks so much for connecting with us in this way. We were knocking on the door of 200 people gathered in that field, and the kids had a blast. So a massive thanks to John, Alice, and Serena for overseeing all the kids' work. Thanks so much too to all of you who made the effort to attend our church update evening this last Wednesday. We hope you were inspired and encouraged for where we find ourselves and for where we are headed. Some great questions on the night too. So exciting times ahead with a few challenges along the way, but we are looking forward to this season of planning and rebuilding. As you know, the giveaway has seen thousands of people come through the doors over these last 20 months in particular. Diane heads up a great team of volunteers. And here's what Yvonne had to say. Serving at the giveaway during the pandemic has been a wonderful experience. We've made so many friends from regular people who have come in. Um, we've built up a great team. Um, last Christmas we made Christmas boxes for some of the mums with tiny babies that couldn't get in. Uh, we've just built up this great rapport. People now come on the Friday walks and also some of the mums and toddlers have progress to the little blessings group so the relationships that have been built up has been amazing we are given such beautiful clothes every week and we give them away with blessings we've prayed for people we've laughed we've cried with people it's just been a wonderful experience 
The giveaway has been and continues to be an incredible opportunity to love and bless our community. What it has also revealed is the number of people who are incredibly lonely. Now this is where you can help. Do you have time on a Tuesday morning from nine through to 12, where you could be available to help listen, have a coffee, have a chat with those who want to talk? Please contact the office and speak to Diane for further information. Now, on weeks two and four, we have kids work happening and growing at Freedom Center. We really need help to strengthen the teams for this. So if you can help in any way, please contact the office, chat to Serena and find out a little more how you can help and support in this next season. Here is the latest addition to the Freedom Church family. Brave Samuel Johannes Strachan was born in the early hours of Saturday the 24th of September. We are delighted for Nigel and Julia, Hannah, Phoebe and Peter. We pray God's blessing upon Brave as he settles into life within the Strachan household. Now, other exciting news is that this afternoon at 3 p.m., little Joy Jefferson will be baptized. Why not come and support her in this exciting step of faith and encourage her? Perhaps you have also felt the nudge to be baptized. Well, it's not too late to get baptized too. So come along today. As a church, we get to do life as family. We share in the highs and lows. It is as family that we continue to pray for Petra, Glenn and Sophie, as they and we mourn the loss of four-month-old Natalie. Thank you for your kind messages, prayerful support and gifts for this precious family. We continue to uphold them in prayer. That's all for Church News this week. Over the next two weeks, I want to share a word which I believe is for us as a church, but could also and equally be a word to encourage any one of us who finds ourselves in a point of need. My heart is not just that we find a way through that point of need, uh, but we find thriving and blessing within it. I've called this breathe because I pray that it would feel like a deep breath, a refreshing breath of the presence of God in your life. We're going to be looking at a story of the prophet of the Lord, Elijah, in the book of Kings, chapter 19, verse 1 to 13. And the story goes like this. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done including the way he'd killed all of the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. 
uh, or the journey ahead will be too much for me. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. The Lord speaks to Elijah. The Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down the altars. They've killed every one of your prophets, and now I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by him. A mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there's the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. For me, when I was younger, I had very little um, by way of adversity in my life. It was paved with marshmallows, bits of pink fluff, uh, pies and helter-skelter rides. Um, things were easy. I had a pair of roller skates and that was all I really needed. Um, and uh, one thing that struck me is that as I got older, I realized that adversity is a certainty. And what we do with it is how we measure maturity. You know, in John 16, 33, it says, I've told you all this so that you might have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. The Bible shows us clearly people's adversity and how they handle it. It gives us human brokenness in spadefuls. We see characters across the scripture facing things that seem uh, broken, that seem wrong, and, and we're allowed to see the frailty of each of those individuals, how they acted well and how they didn't act well. Why is it that the, the Bible allows us to see that? I believe it's to help us. Uh, so I want to look into this story um, about Elijah. And in this moment of adversity in his life, I want to make a few observations. Now, when Elijah comes to this point, at the point at which we pick up this story, um, they're preceding it, there's a period of incredible uh, victory for Elijah. He's been through so much. He predicted a drought successfully and declared it to the leaders of the nation. Uh, he was fed by ravens. Uh, he was um, in a situation where he encountered a widow and he made her flour and oil into an all-you-can-eat buffet that never stopped. Uh, he called down the fire of God on a soaking wet altar, and it was completely consumed. He slew hundreds of the prophets of Baal, and he outran a chariot. He outran a chariot getting back to the place he was meant to be. Elijah then, post all of these victories, is triggered into absolute despair, seemingly by the news that Jezebel sent him. In verse two, it says this, Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow, I have not killed you just as you killed them. We're gonna come back to Elijah in a second. But I wanna chat briefly about some adversity that I have experienced too. You know, when I was um, in Oxford last year in, in the hospital, I had um, almost died once on the beach, and then I'd almost died again three days later um, in the hospital, four days later in the hospital. And on the third time, a week after that, where I'd almost died again, um, I was asking myself the question, does God want me to come home? 
you know, what's his plan in this? Am I a hindrance to him? Does he want me home? Does he want me where I am? Uh, I, I remember actually on the beach the trauma of looking into my son's eyes at the moment where my heart was packing up. And it was a difficult moment where I was asking some deep questions about survival. You know, parallel to this, we also, as a church, have been through some adversity. I don't want to name it all, but we've been in some major legal battles some time ago. Uh, we've experienced major health problems across the church in different ways. There's been the consistency of the COVID dynamic, the, the changes and the challenges, building challenges, staffing changes, etc, etc. There are a couple of things in this story about Elijah that I want to put my finger on that I think might help us in our journeys of adversity. Let's look at Elijah's story. Elijah's response is disproportionate. It's disproportionate. Look at all of the success that he had. He was a prophet of the king of kings. I mean, he definitely heard God. There was no question about that. When you've watched fire come from heaven and burn up a soaking wet altar, you know that God's with you, right? He's been obedient and he's experienced a ton of success. He was strong. He strong-armed hundreds of false prophets. And then this point at the beginning of our text in, in chapter 19, he, it says that he was threatened by Jezebel. He's threatened by a girl and he capitulates. It's completely disproportionate and not entirely unusual, I would suggest. You know, so often uh, the enemy uses adversity um, to throw in questions about our identity. In Matthew, we see Jesus being led into the desert. The desert is dry, it's hideous, it's dusty, it's a place of adversity. He's led there by the Holy Spirit. And the first thing the enemy did is question his identity. He says, if you are the Son of God. And we should see this for what it is. OK. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says this, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for whom he might devour. One incredible scripture. Don't be surprised if when you face adversity, you are thrown in questions about your identity, about who you truly are. In the months following my time in the hospital, I experienced some pretty heavy adversity and questioning of my identity. Those existential questions about identity morphed into some sort of PTSD type symptoms and I'd experience times where I literally wouldn't feel like I could breathe. Aversity was affecting my identity. Likewise, as a church, I remember some of the emotions of the legal process that we went through with the building. That's some really dark moments where we were unsure of God's presence. It was really hard to see where he was in this process. We could talk here about how Jesus counters the attack on his identity by standing on the word of God, and that is completely and absolutely valid and legitimate. But I want us to go back to this story in 1 Kings and look at something that I think is really key, was definitely key for me, is key for us as a church, and was Hugely key for Elijah. In verse 4, it says this 
Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Everything about this passage shouts that this guy has given up. He's isolated himself. He's taken himself alone into the wilderness. He's gone and sat down under a bush and he's asked God to take his life. This is huge steps of vulnerability. Vulnerability is so key for us right now. If you're in a place of adversity, vulnerability is massive. Brené Brown says, courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. In this moment, we see Elijah opening up to God. He's going, I've got nothing left. He sits down, it's a place of submission and and it's expressing a lack of help. He's just flopped on the floor and is vulnerable. And then he asks God, just can you end my life? And then he shares with God his deepest fear And that's that he's destined for nothing more than his ancestors who are just buried in the ground. The thing is, when you allow yourself to be seen in that way, you open yourself up to a truer perspective than you can give yourself. It's true that lawyers advise themselves to never advise themselves. Never take your own advice. Why? because you can't see the wood for the trees when you're looking at it on your own. Vulnerability allows us to share our situation so that a truer perspective might be known. The second thing it does is it destroys isolation. Vulnerability destroys isolation. I had a friend who used to talk about sin and the strength of the enemy in sin. It used to say that the strength of the enemy is seriously undermined when he can't isolate you. In fact, when someone sins, 90% of the damage is done in the isolation and the condemnation. Only 10% is done in the actual sin itself. The enemy tries to isolate us. It's a hunting tactic of a prowling lion looking to pick off the weak and the vulnerable. Vulnerability destroys that potential for hiddenness and isolation. Now, in my post-illness recovery, I had some counselling sessions. I decided to talk to someone, a family friend who is a bit of a therapist, but also a pastor. And I talked through some of the dynamics of being so close to dying. At the end of this first session, where I'd had the opportunity to be really vulnerable, this friend said to me, from the stories I heard about your medical journey, you should have died. I think you need to lay down the confusion of where you are and the confusion of trying to figure out where you're going and you need to start with a blank piece of paper. This is your map. You may not know the road map. You may not be able to see any roads on it, but you can put a pin into the center of that paper as a starting point in a blank page. And that pin is this. God wanted you alive for a reason. That was his advice to me. He was able to bring a perspective to me in a time of adversity that I certainly couldn't see myself, but I needed that perspective. Before I could receive that perspective, it required vulnerability, honesty with God and with others. I want us as a church to hear this message today. He wants us, Freedom Church, 
alive for a purpose. We've come through some adversity. I look at the great victories of the past, the things that he called us to be, to reach and love our community, to blow people's minds with what church can look like, to be out there and serving people. Let's not allow adversity to undermine our identity, either personally or corporately. It's not right to let the enemy pick off the vulnerable, but instead for us to choose vulnerability so that we can move into our true identity. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this, but he says to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Adversity is a certainty. The enemy wants to own your identity, but there is power in vulnerability. I wonder if we might consider as individuals and as a church where, ide- where adversity has opened up room for the enemy to attack our identity. I wonder if we could also consider how we might be vulnerable with one another. I want to encourage you in a couple of ways in this, to have grace for one another, to learn to listen to one another, to move in the true power of the gospel, which is for repentance and reconciliation that God can bring you into a place of strength in your weakness. The promise here is that God's power is made truly known in your weakness. So coming off the back of adversity is a strong place for us to be if we're willing to be vulnerable and ask God to meet us right there. Passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow. Stir passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow. Passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow. Stir passion in my heart, God, let it overflow, let it overflow. Breathe on me, holy. Why my eyes to see there's so much more Cause Jesus you are where it all begins Your beauty calls me deeper in Let it overflow, let it overflow. 
there's so much more, so much more. Cause Jesus, you are where it all begins. Your beauty calls me deeper. Call me deeper in. So pleased you could join us today and I trust you will feel empowered to enter this new week with a sense of God's word leading you and equipping you for life. Don't forget, you can catch up on all our content and news by going to our website, www.freedomchurch.je or give the office a call on 01534 768 957. We are here to serve you and so please let us know how we can help. Have a great week.